I think things are starting to tick back up a bit. People are actually thinking about travel and doing a little bit more research. So we're seeing our traffic go up and rates go up. So nowhere back to where it was and it'll be a good while for that. But we're also out of the, the dark basement, it looks like. Welcome to Travel Matters, the official podcast of TBEX, the community and global gathering of travel creatives since 2009. If you're a blogger, podcaster, YouTuber, Instagrammer, if you create content for travel on any platform, this is the podcast for you. We will be sharing all the latest news, trends and tips for you and interviewing the movers and shakers in the travel creative ecosystem. This is Travel Matters. Here are your hosts, the Radio Vagabond, Palibo and TBEC CEO, Rick Calvert. Welcome to another edition of Travel Matters, the official podcast from TBEX. Hi, Rick. How are you, Pally? Let's say hi to our guests and it's a it's a friend of the family. Hi, Tim. Hi. How are you guys doing? Tim Leffel, uh, can you just uh, for the people who who don't know exactly what you do uh, apart from uh, being uh, one of the two conference directors for uh, TBEC North America, um, you have a, a long history in travel writing. Yeah, I'm one of the old geezers that started out in the pre-internet world as a freelancer writing for magazines back when that was the only option, really, uh, in the mid-90s when I was backpacking around the world. And then uh, eventually I went full-time after it became easier to become a publisher on the web. And I now run five different websites, and I have some books out and still do a little freelancing here and there, but not so much anymore. And normally you're based in Mexico? Yes, that's correct. I, I usually live in Guanajuato, Mexico, where I own a house free and clear, which has come in very handy in this economic travel downturn to live in a place I don't have to pay a mortgage or rent for. But uh, for the moment, I'm in uh, Tampa Bay, Florida, as we speak today, because I had to come back and pick up my daughter who just graduated college. And she unfortunately is going to have to come live with her parents for a little while after graduation, like so many college students are right now, because... uh, a lot of things have ground to a halt. She's going into the media industry, and uh, that's uh, not doing so well right now in terms of the production side. People are watching a lot more media, but there's not much being made. Mm, wow. Well, congratulations, Tim, on your daughter uh, hitting that milestone. That's obviously a big, uh, a big moment in life. Yeah, it's exciting. Well, today we wanted to have you on to talk about a blog post you wrote a couple of weeks back now um, called the future of press trips for travel writers and destinations. Yeah. Thanks. I just wanted to get a sense of where, what the mood was like, not just among the writers, but also among the people who host us, um, the destinations and the travel brands that are in normal times, bringing people on trips uh, to get, you know, press about their destination or their brand uh, how much of a hurry were they in? Uh, what was their budget like? And, um, you know, where did they think things were headed? And I think uh, the encouraging thing was we're relatively on the same page um, on the different sides of the table as far as how this is all going to play out, I think. Um, but there are little differences here and there about in how much of a hurry people are to uh, travel about. You published this uh, a couple of weeks ago, like uh, uh, Rick said. So, June 10. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I guess you did this survey in early June, and that must have been a snapshot of what it was like at that specific time. Yeah, and I, I think this was um, kind of uh, weighted to North America just because that's where I am and where a lot of contacts are. But a lot of the writers who responded were in Europe. And I think they probably are able to move about uh, sooner and more comprehensively than North Americans are just because there's so many countries close together and you've got these sort of uh, regional packs appearing now where, you know, you can go to a neighboring country, but not any further. So, uh, but I think overall, there's still a, a general unease about, you know, certain aspects like flying long distances or being in group trips and things like that that are going to be problematic for a while. Would you say that in general, people were much more comfortable driving than they were taking some mass transportation? Yeah, absolutely. A a large percentage of 
travel writers were willing to go somewhere right now, if they could do it in a car within driving distance, um, it was more than half were willing to do that, you know, within the next couple of quarters. Uh, where, whereas when I changed it to when would you be comfortable getting on a flight, the majority said uh, not until at least Q4. And some people said uh, not until there's a vaccine or treatment. I think it was 16%. So <laughs> sizable number. Mm. Yeah, you had um, 28% said Q4 of this year. 18% said Q3 of this year. 11% said they go yeah. right now. <laughs> so that's actually... Uh, that's over 50% said they go sometime between the beginning of June and Q4. Um, I, I also noticed there's a little bit of a difference where people's willingness to take a trip versus the willingness of DMOs to host a trip. DMOs are looking a little bit further out than creators are. Yeah. And there's a couple of reasons for that. I, I had them leave comments as well, the, the DMO people and, Part of that was budgetary, but part of it was um, they just don't want to be looking like they're attracting people to their destination if it's not safe for people to come there. And so um, they are they don't want to sort of um, spend their budget and their time attracting journalists to come write about the place if the place, in their opinion, isn't really ready. <laughs> you also asked about uh, if... if, if bloggers and content creators were more inclined to take a paid opportunity if it's individual hosted rather than a, a group trip. And 87% said, said yes to that. Yeah, I thought there might be a difference there, but I didn't think it would be that much. It's interesting. Like People are uh, definitely leery about being packed into a van and driving around for days, which is the way too many of those group press trips have been in the past Maybe we'll see a permanent change there. I don't know. But, um, you know, that's been the most economical way for a destination to do it. But it's maybe not the not something people feel comfortable with right now. Isn't another thing that creators really want that DMOs typically prefer not to do and for good reasons on both sides, but creators would prefer to be on a solo trip anytime. Um, and even prefer to kind of make up their own agenda on the things that they're interested in versus here's the preset of list of things that the destination wants us to see. And we're going to take a group of people and we're all going to see the same thing. Well, there is a social aspect that sometimes is kind of nice and people do appreciate that. Maybe they'll appreciate it more in the future since we've been so isolated. But, uh, you know, sometimes there's some com camaraderie there and you make some great friends and you have some shared experiences. But yeah, from a writing standpoint, it's almost always better to be individual and have some choice over the itinerary and just to match the trip to what you cover rather than being carted to 14 different places and maybe two of them actually align with what the focus of your blog is. Maybe this is a, a again, another impetus for destinations to rethink how they do press trips in general now out of necessity, but they might be surprised at the results they get. Even in doing group trips, doing smaller groups where the creators have common interest versus just putting any random 10 people in a van and, again, going through that, you know, list checklist of things that you're going to see on any travel TV show versus, you know, when I read Tim's blog or when I read Pally's blog or listen to Pally's podcast, it could be about totally different things. Right. And some of them have done a pretty good job of that, of bringing in all food writers at one time or uh, people that only write about the outdoors or whatever. But you're right. More often, it's just a random assortment of, hey, let's get some press and <laughs> bring some people in that are bloggers or bring some people in that are freelance journalists. And there's not much of an alignment of interest. So, yeah, it could be problematic. Um, one other opportunity, I think, and I, I've been on some trips where this has been the case. Some uh, destinations that are really good at this will just hand writers a passport that basically gets them into, you know, 20 or 30 different attractions around the city for free and it gets them on public transportation for free. So then the writer can just go do pick and choose the things that really make sense for them and ignore the ones that don't. And that works better in a walkable city than it does in other places. But I've, that's the 
that's the kind of um, arrangement I had when I went to Savannah, Georgia. And it's the arrangement I had when I went to Quebec City in Canada. And I found that really refreshing because it just put it all into my hands that I could uh, follow their suggestions. But I had some time to just go do whatever made sense. In the survey, you also uh, surveyed the industry. What was some of the, the the questions and some of the surprises, or did you get confirmed in some of the answers? Well, I knew from a lot of conversation as conversations I'd been having that their budget had been cut, and I think uh, there's been a couple other surveys out there showing people's budgets have been been cut by as much as, you know, 50, 60, 70 percent in some cases because they rely on bed taxes or government support or whatever. So they're looking for ways to stretch the little bit that they have. Uh, what's encouraging to me is they seem to be looking to bloggers uh, to spend that money with rather than uh, putting, you know, a hundred thousand dollar ad in a magazine <laughs> or something. So um, I, I was glad to see that. And they do believe that inviting Uh, travel writers to their destination is worth the money. They're still willing to invest in that. Uh, so I think uh, it was pretty encouraging to see that um, we're not as expendable as maybe we feel sometimes in terms of how they're spending their money, that maybe they're spending in a lot of ways that we think is a waste, but they also do think that spending the money with uh, content creators, whether that be uh, bloggers or YouTubers or you know, podcasters or whatever, they do think that's a worthwhile expense. And they're all looking to start up trips again. I mean, some of them, not till, uh, you know, they're not planning on group trips until a year from now, but they're planning on doing individual ones soon or in the next quarter. You're listening to Travel Matters, the official podcast of TBEX. When I when I read your uh, your 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 blog post uh, with the results of the survey, I thought the results were interesting. And uh, when I got really excited was uh, when you started uh, giving some thought as to what the future might bring. You talk about uh, there may be some opportunities of new kinds of uh, media partnerships in in the future. You you have four things on the list. Sure. Well, the first one is work more with local writers. Uh, well, the partnership between local writers and and their destination. Uh, I, I've never met a travel writer that didn't complain about this, that basically said they were ignored by their tourism board in that city or their tourism board in that state, that they can't get the time of day from them. They never get invited. And so I think there's an opportunity there for almost every destination to work more closely with the travel writers who live in that area, whether it's traditional journalists who are writing for magazines or whether it's bloggers or YouTubers. I mean, I feel like most of them have no idea who's in their area. So they should be hopefully spending this time uh, cultivating those relationships and reaching out to them. And back to that individual press trip thing, it's very easy for a local person to just, you know, go do something here and then go do something again three days from now. And they don't have to be carted around anywhere. They've got their own transportation. So it, it works, it, it works well for both sides. I think um, the writer doesn't have to spend as much time and money on it. Uh, the destination doesn't have to spend as much time and money on it. And you can do more in-depth stories because you're in the area instead of just parachuting in. So that's the easy one. It's so obvious. I know, Tim, you gave the politically correct excuse that destinations don't know who is in their area. And I'm sure that is the case sometimes where creators don't approach their local destination because they just, you know, they're thinking outward versus inward. But the truth is most destinations, or I'll say many destinations, are approached by local creators all the time. Because we typically love the place we live in, and we want to promote it. And I, I'm from San Diego. Again, I love San Diego. I love so many things about it. And I always thought a dream job for me would be to work for the San Diego Tourist Board, because I know I could sell this city. But when I go to the San Diego Tourist Board and talk to them about, you know, hosting creators, they have no interest. And I'm like, you guys, this could be the best thing ever. Uh, and I know the city as well as anyone. 
yes, there's value in bringing in outside visitors to your destination to get a, a perspective of somebody who's seeing it with fresh eyes. But it's just such a wasted opportunity to not work with people locally. And when you think of things that are that are ever changing, like bars and restaurants, uh, you know, local services. Why wouldn't you want somebody local who's got their finger on the pulse rather than someone who has to fly in and decide what are the 10 best restaurants in your city? So this kind of ties into one of your uh, next points. Well, it, it actually ties in to the next two points I see for sure. Consider longer media visits that have more depth. Again, a local writer can obviously stay, they live there. So, but explain that a little bit more about why a destination might want to think about longer visits with more depth. Well, the problem with that kind of trip we talked about earlier, which I call here 12 stops in two days, is that you're only seeing the surface of a place and you're only getting uh, a limited amount of time in each of those stops. You're just getting the general pitch that everyone gets who visits, visits there and then you move on and that's the end of it. And I feel like those maybe work for a triple A magazine where you're just trying to show people who drive there what the highlights are, but they don't work very well for a blog. I mean, you're trying to provide your readers some insider information and hopefully more depth. And they certainly don't work for a narrative story. It's almost impossible to write any kind of narrative travel story from one of those press trips. Whereas if you stick around for a while, then you can actually interview people and you know talk to the locals and uh, speak spend a few hours people watching and go really try the food from more than the official restaurants that they've taken you to. And maybe even try some true local food that comes from a street cart or, uh, you know, some local wine at a vineyard that nobody's heard of. There's, you know, there's an endless number of things you can do if you're in a place for a longer period and you just get to know it better if you're, if you're there more than just a few days and then you're out again. Yeah. And, and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm first and foremost, I'm a digital nomad and a, and a full time traveler. So sometimes I stay longer in a place and actually the longest day up until, uh, uh, COVID-19 hit uh, was also Cape Town the last time I was here I was here for two months just being here and and doing my regular do job but then uh, I also recorded so much because I I know this city and I had so many recordings and so many photos so I had s I think I put out five episodes from uh, from Cape Town just because I was here for a longer time and I had so many stories to share so it makes sense. So, Pally, let me ask you this question first, because you are the perfect person. How does a tourist board find out when you or people like you are coming to stay in their destination for, you know, a month or six months? I, I try to go to the, uh, the, the big events like uh, WTM and ITB. And, and if I know that I'm going to an area, I try to... Uh, get some connections there but you'll typically approach a tourist board when you're going to be in a place for a while and say hey just so you know i'm here yeah, yeah and i'm yeah. planning to do some stories is there anything you think i should see or anything like that mm. so that's that's your next suggestion tim is what about a travel writer in residence program again perfect fit for a local blogger but um how should dmos go about that and you mentioned our friends at costa brava who've done an excellent job of this for a decade now, as you say. Yeah, I think there's a big opportunity here. Uh, and both these things kind of tie together for digital nomads and for people who are actually staying in one place for a while. I don't think the DMOs really know how to deal with either of those categories or they haven't done a very good job of it so far. Most of them, they are used to bringing people in and paying for all their expenses for a few days or even a week and then sending them back on their way. And they're not really sure how to deal with some hybrid approach where Someone's getting there on their own, and maybe they've even got an Airbnb rented for a month, but you know they want the local destination marketing people to help them out to discover what's great about the city. So that's when you give them one of those attraction passports, or you invite them to some events, or you set them up with some restaurants and whatever. Uh, but there's a big opportunity there, I think, not being exploited. And because of because some digital nomads have had bad experiences reaching out to these cities where they've just kind of been brushed off, uh, they haven't really done as much as they can, I think, uh, to actually 
exploit those opportunities for both sides to make it better for both. I mean, one example I can think of off the top of my head, I got in touch with Buenos Aires tourism one time because I was going there for a week and a half before I went out and saw the rest of Argentina. They said, oh, yeah, well, whatever. Come by our office when you get here. So (laughs) I went by their office and to meet with this woman who was the head of PR for the city. And she handed me some brochures and said, "Okay, have a good time. (laughs) That was the end of it. And I was and I had three assignments from print publications on top of what I was doing for my blogs and just completely got the brush off. And I've had that happen a few times. I'm just that's the one that comes to mind because I actually met with them face to face. But uh, a lot of times um, there's a budget for press trips and there's a budget for everything else. And they don't really know where to put this, which which box it goes into. For DMOs, I'll, I'll defend them a little bit, as you did earlier, Tim. They really do get inundated with requests. Yeah, and from people that shouldn't be bothering them in the first place, I will freely admit <laughs> a lot of those. Yeah, but it is their job to separate the wheat from the chaff um, and when – Again, a writer like you says, I'm going to be in your destination for a month um, or even a week, and I've got three you know, print assignments. I publish five online sites with a – I don't know what your total number of sites are, Tim. You're building your empire bigger every day. <laughs> and you know, with a combined readership of you know, 700,000 readers, you would think that th- they should take advantage of that opportunity. But – Again, Costa Brava is is a perfect model. They they've been doing this for years and years and years. You know, they encourage people to stay longer if they if they hear somebody's coming to town and uh, and there's a few other destinations who've done this where they just rent an apartment year long and they just tell mm-hmm. creators who come to town, "Hey, you want to stay here for 2 weeks? Go ahead, no problem." Plus there's going to be a lot of empty hotel rooms for a long time to come. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'll give you an example of uh, what I did when I was in, last year. I was invited to uh, Sri Lanka uh, to do a ten-day uh, press trip, and I said, uh, "When you book the flights out, can you book it two weeks later after the press trip?" I, I, on a press trip, it's it's it, it's hectic, and there's a program you need to do a lot of stuff. But I also wanted to try to just live there and and go to the local grocery shop and uh, just be part of it and get it more under my skin. Uh, so that's also something that ties into uh, what, you, what you're talking about, Tim, uh, about staying longer. I'll give, a, I'll give an example, too. Um, so our average stay at TBEX when we, help, we you know, have our conferences is 10 days. Um, but depending on the destination, that can go up. When we were in um, Athens, Greece a few years ago, our average stay – we're talking hundreds of travel creators. Our average stay was 28 days. Wow. And that that's because, you know, travel writers are, first of all, passionate about travel. And they came for our event, and they wanted to take that opportunity to see as much as of Greece as they possibly could while they were there. I think I spent about that long in uh, Wyoming and Montana too, when we were there for TBEX. And I actually just put out an article this week from that trip, which was last September. It's probably the fifth or sixth one I've done, which is back to that depth thing again. (laughs) So it's probably a good question when for a DMO to ask a creator when they're coming to town is how long do you plan on staying? Not just, Hey, can you do this three day thing? How long do you plan on being here? Again, it's a really important point. Typically, the creator doesn't expect them to pay for them to stay there for a month. No. Right? And feed them for a month and, you know, wine and dine them for a month. Uh, no, and that's where I was talking about it's kind of an in-between. That's a little bit of a problem. Like maybe the person already has their Airbnb rented and, you know, they're expecting to buy their own groceries, but they don't want to pay to get into any of the things that they're going to write about. So just take care of that part. Museums, zoos, maybe a festival. Yeah, and if you can connect them, yeah, with a festival, or if you can connect them to uh, the brewmaster at a few breweries that they write about beer, or if you can connect them with some local wineries, you know, be a facilitator, then that would be much appreciated. Thank you for sharing Travel Matters with your friends and followers on social media. You're the best. So your fourth 
recommendation was spread some money around with riders who have already visited. Yeah, and that actually comes from direct experience because some of them are doing that. And I've actually closed three deals during this pandemic. So it tells me that some of these destinations and brands are actually realizing that's a good way to spend their funds. Um, So we've got one happening with San Miguel de Allende in Mexico, which is right down the road from where I live. I never gotten the time of day from them directly back to this <laughs> courting local writers thing, <laughs> but their PR agency is in New York and they're the guy. You're actually, so, so just to take that one step further, sorry, Tim, you're actually gold because you're an American, a target market for them, but you live there. Right. <laughs> and I know you live in Mexico and I know who else has been there and can tap into that network. So it's a program where six bloggers are going to write stories about San Miguel Day in Day. They've already been there. They've already got photos. And so, you know, the destination's going to pay them all a bit to get this done because they don't have to fly anybody in. They don't have to put them up at a hotel. The people are already fans and, you know, they're willing to take a little direction on what the what the uh, target message is going to be so that it's put out there correctly in these unusual times. <laughs> and that's very easy to set up. And I think a lot of times um, the de- the destinations bring someone in, they file the report, and then they move on and never talk to that person again. But there's an opportunity there for people who already have been to the place and love it and are willing to write more about it because they've got lots of material and notes and photos and maybe some video. So there's a lot of opportunity there with just uh, – a bit of money. I mean, they're not going to do it for nothing unless they're really good friends with you or something, but uh, they probably will do it for not a whole lot of a lot of hit to your marketing budget. So that's actually a good tip on the DMO side and the creator side, where creators should probably be approaching destinations they've already been to. And let's say they've already got some content. They've got some great photos or videos that they haven't used yet. Um, or that they could repurpose and they've got some story ideas um, and they've already been there. They've already done the research. So would you recommend that creators contact destinations like that and say, Hey, you know, I've already been there. I've already got the content. What do you think about commissioning me to do some work for you guys? Absolutely. This is the best time to do that. This is a golden opportunity. Usually writers are trying to get someone to fly them to New Zealand or to Easter Island or the Maldives or something, but that's not happening right now. So reach out to people you've traveled with before and that's a better opportunity. One thing, again, I noticed from your, uh, from the study in general is, and the same thing that we hear, um, you know, in the groups in our community, travel creators want to travel as soon as they think it's safe. They want to go. Yeah. One way or another, they're going to, Find a way if it's only domestic and they got to rent a cabin or take a car trip or an RV trip or whatever. They're going to find a way to get out there and explore. Yep. And I think this is the time to sort of step back and look at what new opportunities are here. And it's kind of a creative destruction period where maybe something you always did in the past isn't going to work right now, but maybe something better can pop up instead and you can find it's a, it's a better way to do things, a better way to get your message out. So This is a good time to put on your thinking cap and be creative and uh, see who and how you can work with different uh, travel content creators, whether it's writers or video creators or podcasters or whoever. Thank you so much, Tim. Uh, Do you have any good news for us? I do, actually. My uh, ad earnings are up to where they were in February, and most of the bloggers I'm talking to are seeing something similar. Not so much the direct deals, but just the banner ads that show up on our sites. So uh, I think things are starting to tick back up a bit. People are actually thinking about travel and doing a little bit more research. So we're seeing our traffic go up and rates go up. So nowhere back to where it was, and it'll be a good while for that. But we're also out of the, the dark basement, it looks like. That sounds so good. That is great news, Tim. That means that not only do travel creators want to travel, that means travelers want to travel. If, if you're if your traffic's going up and your advertising's going up, that means that people are looking where to go. Yeah, and it means the brands are confident enough to put some money back out into the marketplace again, whether that's hotel chains or OTAs or destinations or whatever. So it's encouraging that the, the ad spend's going up. 
And Tim, if you want to put on your other hat for a second, Pally, do we want to talk about yeah, we do. Lafayette we in do. October? Um, Tim actually asked me this question today, <laughs> as did uh, some people in the Facebook group, because we announced uh, another keynote speaker, Jay Dakote, um, who is a chef who lives in uh, Baton Rouge. Um, he's also hosts his own radio show. He's a podcaster. He's been on uh, Chopped a couple of times. Um, and all of this started, he built his um, creator empire from his blog. That was the genesis of um, of Jay's career. And um, we think he's just got a great inspirational story to tell. And he's local there in Louisiana um, from Baton Rouge. But when we posted that, people said, is the event happening in October? Um and the honest answer is, and, and again, Tim emailed me today, says, is the event happening in October? <laughs> uh, uh, Pally, you've asked me that question, oh. too. Uh, is the event happening? And can I get there from South Africa or wherever you are in the world? Um, and the honest answer is, I don't know. Um, and it goes back to you know, what we talked about earlier, the uncertainty of the COVID world. Yeah. Um, we have talked to Lafayette about postponing the event and i just have to say we give tourist boards a hard time sometimes on this podcast um but the typically the tourist boards that come to tbex are really good and the tbex and the the tourist boards that host tbex are amazing and lafayette is definitely in that category um they have been a true partner from the very beginning and it's like we're thinking the same thing when we talk about this, you know, it's such a gigantic subject uh, because cities invest a lot of money when they host a conference like TBEX. So when the cases started to go up again, I, I would say until about a month ago, we we're pretty certain the event is happening in October and things are getting better and we think we'll be okay. And your survey reflects that Tim. Um, but then cases started going up. So last week we had this conversation. Hey, should we postpone? Should we talk about alternatives? Um, what's the plan? We'd already had the discussion with the tourist board and with the Cajun Dome um, about what do we do on site based on the conditions last month? How do we have people social distance? We have um, hand sanitization stations. We have, you know, barriers to separate people during um, uh, speed networking. Like you see when you go to the store, they've got these, you know, plexiglass barriers up. Um, people wearing masks, reducing the size of um, seating in, in all the conference rooms, um, having events outdoors whenever we can, because that's generally perceived to be safer than being indoors. So we, we had a full plan on what we should do now that the cases have gone up. The conversation is, should we postpone? And what we decided last week was not yet. We very well could. Um, and if things continue the way they are now, we will. There's no doubt. The number one most important thing is safety of our attendees and the community that we're visiting. And so if it's not safe, the event will be postponed. We're also getting very close to the point where people are making those plans and flight costs will start to go up. And so we want to make that decision before we get to that drop dead where people just can't wait anymore um, to plan and, and, and it will cost them too much money to, uh, to make those changes. So maybe don't use that phrase drop dead though, when you announce it. <laughs> oh, man, sorry. <laughs> so again, the COVID world you gotta have your choice of words. So, so in the next couple of weeks, we will make a decision. We will make an announcement and it'll absolutely be based on the conditions of the pandemic. Um, again, as we said, people want to travel and, they want to see their friends and their peers and um, want to do business with each other. So our first option would be to do the event in October as long as it is safe. 
But if there's any question of that, we will definitely postpone the event. So then now it's a question of when will it be, if not October? And we don't know the answer to that either. We're exploring those dates with um, with Lafayette. And again, we're, we're 100% in alignment on what we think we should do. So we just think it's better if we just stay calm, wait and see if things get better or they don't, and then make a decision in the, by the end of this month for sure. So Sounds good. That's where we're at. Sorry, guys. I always like to give good news, and it sucks, this uncertainty I, for all of us. I was just about to say, and on, on that happy note. <laughs> <laughs> I do have uh, – you want me to give you a little encouraging news? Yeah, I please do. Please before. do. I need that. We've already, conf- we've already confirmed a destination for TBEX North America 2021. So if we postpone Lafayette, that means it will be pushed into 2021 for sure. We'll have two North America events next year, if that happens. And two Europe. <laughs> maybe. 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 Yeah. At this point, it definitely looks like Catania will be in 2021. For international travel, it's just too – November is just too soon, which was our target date. Um, and again, keeping this positive, there will be a TBEX Asia in 2021. Awesome. Third quarter, fourth quarter. That's going to be a busy year. Wow. Yep. And – Probably another TBEX event. So there's probably will be four TBEX events in 2021. And we're already confirming events for 2022 and 2023. So this will end eventually. And the future does look really, really good for travel creators. It's definitely going to take time for travel to resume. And Tim, I'm sure you've seen those reports that saying that travel won't rebound until 2023 to reach the numbers we were before this started. Perhaps, but maybe some of that's good. Maybe we don't have to have so many giant cruise ships, for instance, and maybe we'll have less over tourism. So there will be some silver linings. (laughs) There will be some changes. But again, the good news for creators is that they are integral to this recovery. And there will be a need for creators to go out and talk about destinations and what the new reality is of travel long before travel fully recovers. Yeah. So sounds good. Yeah. Uh, that's the good news. Let's try to end on that note. Sounds good. Well, thank you guys. It was uh, a pleasure as always. And I uh, can't wait to see you, both of you, in, in, in person, hopefully soon. But uh, you never know. Thank you, Pally. Thank you, Tim. Thanks for having me. Thank you. You've been listening to Travel Matters, the official podcast of TBEX. This episode of Travel Matters was hosted by TBEX CEO Rick Calvert and Radio Vagabond Pala Bo and produced by radioguru.co.uk. See more about upcoming TBEX events on tbexcon.com. You can follow Palabo on theradiovagabond.com. <laughs>